Voting is important, more important than we sometimes realize. The first time I ever voted was in the 2000 presidential election, Bush v. Gore. I was in my second year of college at The Ohio State University. My friends from campus ministry were all voting for Bush because he was against abortion. My pastor even screamed from the pulpit that abortion was the only issue that mattered. At the time, I was staunchly pro-life. The evangelicalism was strong with this one. But voting based on that one issue bothered me, even then, because there were so many other issues that mattered to me. At the time, the ones I felt strongest about were poverty, equal access to education, and affirmative action. So I was torn, and I agonized over my vote. Then I remember talking to my dad the day before the election. And if you remember from some of my previous episodes, you know that my late father was a Republican and ran for office twice as a GOP candidate in very Democratic Detroit. But in 2000, my dad didn't care for either presidential candidate. When I talked to him over the phone, he said that he could guess who my friends in my church were voting for. But he reminded me that I was smart, I was politically aware, and I could decide for myself who I felt was the right candidate to vote for. Back in those days, this was before the current wave of voter suppression, and it was easier for college students living away from home to vote where they went to college. So I walked over to the old OSU Student Union and pushed a button to cast my vote for Al Gore. In 2000, George W. Bush got fewer votes than Al Gore, but as we all know, won the election. It was, of course, due to the Electoral College, similar to what happened in 2016, where Hillary Clinton got 3 million more votes, but Donald Trump won the election. But the 2000 election was different. Al Gore sued for a recount in Florida, as the vote was close and whoever won Florida would win the election. So instead of election night being a night of extreme elation or extreme fear and sadness, as it was in 2016, in 2000, it was a waiting game. Days turned into weeks, and eventually the U.S. Supreme Court ruled along partisan lines in favor of George W. Bush in the Florida recount, which meant that he won the election. Now, you would think that this would have been a lesson in why voting doesn't matter, but no, it's a lesson in why voting does matter, not just for the term the public servants we vote for serve, but for years, decades, and even generations after. I'm your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potstirer Podcast. By the time this episode is released, we will be about a month out from the midterm general election on Tuesday, November 6th. In many states, you can still register, but time is ticking fast. Some states, it's about 30 days before the election. Others, it's closer to the election 15 days or even day of. Here in Ohio, it's 30 days before the election, but because the 30 days falls on a Sunday, the deadline is October 9th. If you are an American citizen, Stop right now and make sure you are registered to vote. Go to your state elections board website or vote.org. And if you believe you're registered, check to make sure because states can legally purge their voter rolls, care of the U.S. Supreme Court. If you're not sure, check. And if you're not registered, be sure to register now. No matter what state you live in, red, blue, or in between, make sure you are registering to vote. And if you're not going to be in town for the general election, be sure to sign up for an absentee ballot or take advantage of early voting if available in your state. Now, I'll acknowledge that elections in the last 20 years, particularly presidential elections, have eroded people's faith in the vote, believing that voting doesn't make a difference. At least for presidential elections, people have asked, what's the point of voting if the Electoral College can give the election to someone the majority of American voters didn't vote for? I am in the camp that the Electoral College should be abolished because it means that votes in some states are worth more than votes in other states. In the modern age, 
age, where it's easier for people to move and state economies are more connected with other states and even other countries. The idea that small states need to be represented more than larger states is archaic. I believe the guiding principle should be one person, one vote. And we should not have our vote weighted based on the state you live in. And I'm saying this as someone who lives in a swing state. I think at this point, that's the sole reason the Electoral College exists. It's definitely not a safeguard to protect us from mob rule because 2016 proved that wrong. And the challenge is that presidential elections have the most turnout. Midterm elections, which is what we're looking at in 2018, tend to have very low turnout, often hovering around 40% of eligible voters. Among young people, 18 to 29 year olds, turnout is even lower, even though there are so many political issues that have real life consequences for this age group, such as mental health care, education, and student loans, and wage stagnation. But at the end of the day, voting still matters. If we're to look at where we are today, an American dystopia for many of us, with a thieving, flandering, Nazi sympathizing reality star in the Oval Office, and sycophants running Congress and soon the courts who condone caging refugee children, splitting immigrant families, removing LGBT people from public life, police executions of unarmed and legally armed civilians, especially people of color, gutting the safety net, rape culture, and making healthcare even less accessible to those who need it most. If we look at how we got to where we are today, we shouldn't just go back to 2016. Oh no. We should go back much, much earlier. Since 1980, Americans have been voting in conservative presidents and, more gradually, members of Congress. Much of that is due to the Southern strategy, which is a way of courting white Southerners by covertly appealing to race, without explicitly using racist language, as well as the rise of the religious right, which has guided many religious Americans, especially white evangelicals and Roman Catholics, in a specific partisan direction due to the abortion issue, and to a degree, homosexuality. Both of these movements have made it clear to sympathetic voters what issues mattered, and more importantly, who the good guys are and who are the bad guys. Because if you can define your friends and foes, the issues and the morality behind them matter less. Meanwhile, the Democrats, who started out the 1980s more liberal, started moving over to the right, which disenchanted progressive voters and has led to a slipping share of the electorate. So even though there were more Democrats than Republicans, Republicans were gaining ground and Democrats were even less likely to go to the polls than they were already. So conservative presidents nominate conservative pro-business justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court has become more conservative over the past several decades, and the increasing conservatism in the U.S. Supreme Court leads to decisions that make a huge difference. One of these decisions is Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission in 2010. The court decided 5-4 to four that political spending is a form of free speech, protected under the First Amendment, and corporations and private organizations are legally considered people, which is a doctrine called corporate personhood. Due to corporate personhood and free speech rights, the government cannot restrict corporate political spending. This decision led to a huge flood of money in politics from private corporations and political organizations, which disproportionately flowed into Republican coffers, as the GOP is considered the pro-business party and has more support from businesses. Citizens United made a huge difference. It helped to fund Republican candidates running for office at all levels of government, from town council to the presidency. One of the places where the money flowed was in state-level offices. Now, this is important for two reasons. Number one, state legislatures redraw congressional districts after each census as the number of congressional seats is recalculated based on population. And number two, states run elections. So the state secretary of state, along with the state legislature, are key in how elections are run in each state, 
including the rules, regulations, who's eligible, when and how people can register, and so on. So the money flowed for these candidates, and Americans went to the polls in the 2010 midterms and voted overwhelmingly for Republicans. This set the stage for voter suppression and gerrymandering, two methods to ensure the GOP no longer has to work or be responsive to the American people to stay in power. When I talk about suppressing the vote, I'm talking about using methods that artificially lower the number of voters who come out for the opposing party and also lowering their impact. Typically, voter suppression that Republicans employ is aimed at poor people and people of color because they're more likely than average to vote for Democrats, they're often used as scapegoats in GOP rhetoric, and have the least power in our society to effectively fight back. This is what voter suppression looks like. In recent years, state legislatures have employed strict voter ID laws that disproportionately affect poor and minority voters. Some might ask how voter ID laws disproportionately affect those groups. I mean, on their face, they're class blind and color blind, but the devil is in the details. Driver's licenses and state IDs cost money. There's the cost of the ID itself, or even in locations where you can obtain a free ID. You need money and time to obtain the documents needed to get the ID. Birth certificates cost money, other identifying documents often cost money, and for elderly Americans, especially older black Americans from the South, birth certificates might not even exist. So it could amount to what seems like little money for those of us who have well-paying jobs, probably under $100, likely less, if you need to obtain supporting documents. But if you're making poverty wages, $100 is a pretty big deal. Even $50 can put a dent in your budget. But let's say you have the documents you need. How do you get there and how do you find the time? Not everybody has a reliable car or a job with hours that allow you to easily stop by your local DMV and wait in line forever. There are plenty of cities in this country where public transportation is not that great. And again, it costs money. On top of that, some states have been closing DMV branches in locations where poor and minority populations tend to live. So it makes it even more difficult for them to obtain the ID they need. Voter ID laws also disproportionately affect young people. Young people are more likely to be in college, yet in recent years, many states no longer list the college campus ID as an acceptable form of identification in order to vote. Sure, students can get an absentee ballot, but few will go through the trouble of doing it. It's a lot easier to vote in their own neighborhoods. And since on-campus students typically live in their dorms most of the year, why should they not be able to vote where they actually live? Now, gerrymandering refers to state legislatures drawing districts for U.S. House reps and often state legislatures in a way to gain maximum partisan advantage. It results in underrepresentation of some groups in the electorate and overrepresentation of other groups. It's fundamentally anti-democratic, but it is a way that a political party can artificially hold onto power and insulate itself from demographic and ideological realities. The best way I can describe the effects of gerrymandering is here in Ohio, where I live. So Ohio is known as a swing state. In presidential elections, it has a tendency to go either Republican or Democrat. That's because Ohioans are pretty much evenly divided between the two major parties. There are some regions that are more red or more blue. Ohio has a lot of cities. Most are blue, while the suburban and rural areas are mostly red. But taken as a whole, Ohio is pretty much half and half. But Republicans control Ohio's state legislature. The state house has a Republican majority of 66 to 33, while the state Senate has a GOP majority of 24 to 39. In Congress, the Senate has one of each, one Republican and one Democrat, because that is a statewide election, not set up by district. But in the House of Representatives, Ohio, a swing state, a state of half Republicans and half Democrats, is represented by 12 Republicans and only four Democrats. Something is wrong with this picture, and that something 
is gerrymandering. Well then, Jay, why bother voting then? You just said there's voter suppression and gerrymandering, and not to mention Russian interference too. What is the point of voting? Gerrymandering and voter suppression, along with foreign meddling, work so well here because the vote is close. And the reason why the vote is so close is that Republicans are more likely to vote than Democrats, especially in off-year elections, elections where the presidency is not on the ballot. This is why registering people who don't vote is so important. Because if we can get more people to vote, it will be a lot harder to continue the system of unequal representation because partisans can no longer game the system. Historically, it's been more difficult to get Democrats to vote regularly than Republicans. This wasn't always due to voter suppression. It had more to do with the demographics of each party and opportunity cost. Key constituencies of the Democratic Party, particularly poor and working class Americans, Black Americans, and subsets of Latino Americans, such as Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans on the mainland, are more likely than average to have trouble making ends meet and have less formal education than average. Many Americans who are part of these groups work jobs that pay little, sometimes multiple jobs, and have to worry about making ends meet and providing for themselves and their families, so there's little time to bone up on politics and even less time to vote. Having less formal education can mean that digesting available information about candidates and issues and how they affect them personally can feel daunting. The time and effort it takes to vote for people who are in this position might not feel worth the payoff. After all, how often is it that one vote makes a difference in a given election? And even if it does, how many people truly feel like who they elect makes a real difference in their day-to-day -day lives? So this means that, in the aggregate, it's harder to get Democrats to the polls than Republicans. So given these conditions, Republicans went to work further making it even more difficult for these groups to vote. Poor Americans, Black Americans, and Latino Americans, people who already found it difficult to vote. And at the same time, drawing the map so that even if they did vote, it would matter even less. Over the past 15 or 20 years, there has been a concerted effort by the GOP to execute their plan, and a part of this plan has been to enact voter ID laws. And on its face, it would make sense. We need IDs for lots of things, such as driving, getting on an airplane or renting a car, obtaining a job that isn't under the table, so on and so forth. But none of these things are rights. Voting is a right. In a democracy, including a democratic republic, the people have the right to be heard, the right to be part of the governing process for the people by the people, and that is through the vote. The chief reason Republicans cited for making these changes is voter fraud. Voter fraud is extremely rare. From 2000 to 2016, of over 1 billion votes, only 31 votes were fraudulent. Do the math, guys. Are we really doing this for 31 votes out of 1 billion? But it doesn't stop the scaremongering, such as the bolt-faced Trump lie that 3 million people illegally voted for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 presidential election. At the same time, some states, such as Alabama, North Carolina, and Wisconsin, have worked to close DMVs, particularly in areas where high concentrations of poor Black and Latino people live. In North Carolina in particular, there was evidence shown in court that their voter ID and election laws were written with the purpose of disenfranchising Black voters. The North Carolina GOP looked into the types of IDs Black North Carolinians are more likely to use and banned those IDs in favor of the types whites were more likely to use. They also researched when Black people are more likely to vote, particularly the first seven days of early voting and Sunday voting, and eliminated these as well. The state explicitly acknowledged in a lawsuit that counties with Sunday voting were disproportionately Black and Democratic, and that is why they eliminated Sunday voting. So to make a long story short, 
voting placed Republicans in power at the highest level. And these Republicans appointed justices who later made a ruling, actually several rulings, but I just talked about Citizens United, that gave Republicans a huge funding advantage. This funding advantage helped them get out the vote, which led to Republican takeovers of state-level offices. These Republicans then rigged the system so that it would be extremely difficult to hold them accountable via the vote. This is how voting got us here. This is why the vote matters. And even under these conditions, the vote still matters for now. Election day is just around the corner. Be sure to get registered as soon as you hear this message. That's right. Hit pause on this podcast and check out vote.org where you can confirm you're registered to vote, find out how to get registered in your state, look into absentee ballots if you aren't going to be available on election day, as well as early voting if available in your state, and find out where your polling place is, vote.org. This is not a sponsored message, just a public service announcement from Potstirer Podcast. Democracy is eroding, and there's so much to be angry about these days when we watch our government in action. But don't just get mad. Vote. In these chaotic times, sometimes we need to be reminded that there is hope. At the time I'm recording this, the confirmation for Brett Kavanaugh to the U.S. Supreme Court was delayed for an extended FBI investigation into allegations of sexual assault that the White House and Kavanaugh's attorneys are attempting to curtail. The Kavanaugh confirmation hearings and the testimony of accuser Christine Blasey Ford have been really difficult for our country. The Trump presidency itself is freaking triggering. But this confirmation was on another level. A lot of us are discovering what the people in our lives we thought we knew truly think about consent and sexual assault, and finding out just how widespread sexual assault and rape is among women and men. From conversations with friends to people coming out on Facebook and Twitter and in other forums sharing their stories of rape and sexual assault. And then you think to yourself that all these survivors speaking up about their assaults and how many didn't report it with the victim blaming that goes on with rape, especially decades ago. And even now, as we can see with these hearings, I can't say I blame them. You look at all these people that are revealing that they have been assaulted. And false reports are rare, so these are likely true. They didn't rape themselves. They didn't abuse themselves. And that reality, that we may have a lot of sexual abusers roaming free in this country, most of whom have not been arrested, have not gone to trial, have not been convicted or served their time. That reality is actually pretty horrifying. And as long as those predators are well-connected and well-off and well-respected, little to nothing is done about it. Rape culture isn't simply an SJW catchphrase. It's a real epidemic. So on the heels of that, I went up to Dayton, Ohio. Dayton's about an hour away from Cincinnati to attend the 2018 annual lecture on faith and civic life at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Their special guest speaker was Reverend Jim Wallace. Reverend Wallace is an evangelical minister, author, activist, and founder and editor of Sojourners, a Christian magazine that focuses on social justice. I first heard about Sojourners and Reverend Wallace through a close friend of mine well over a decade ago. Before that, the only forms of evangelical expression I was familiar with were conservative, with some attempts at cross-cultural communication and racial reconciliation but it was largely on conservative terms. I read Wallace's book, God's Politics, and I made an attempt at running a study group for the book. That part didn't go so well. But the book truly spoke to me, a Christian who was on the evangelical train, but wasn't so sure about the destination. Wallace's book spoke to the inconsistencies that truly bothered me, that life issues didn't start and end at abortion, but there were other life issues that matter just as much. And it helped to know that I wasn't alone. It has been really difficult to stay within a Christian tradition that has increasingly sold its soul for political power and lacks any degree of self-awareness. 
I felt for a long time that I could be one of those people making a difference within the tradition, encouraging empathy, and being a bridge builder. But 81% of white evangelical voters voted for Donald Trump, and many are co-signing his words and actions in violation of the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And conservative evangelical leadership has cultivated a lack of empathy among their flock for those who are oppressed, those who suffer, those who have little to no power in society. They support a lack of empathy for those of us who are concerned about being pulled over by the wrong cop at the wrong time, who worry about our families being split up and deported to our countries of origin to die, who might not be able to find a place to live or may lose their jobs because the person they love is the wrong gender, who have experienced sexual assault and couldn't speak about the painful experience until years later. There is nothing unifying or biblical or godly or Christian about that. This lack of compassion and empathy is what is pushing out evangelicals of color as well as white evangelicals that have a heart for social justice in white and multiracial evangelical churches with white leadership all across this country. It's one thing to say, we're not racist and we love everybody. But it's another to put our money where our mouth is and actually speak out and act against institutionalized white supremacy and its children, white privilege, male privilege, and straight privilege. I can't co-sign the naked reach for political power while basic human decency and morality are compromised. And I can't go along with the authoritarian cult-like tendencies of the evangelical movement that stifle principled dissent where preserving the ego of the leadership is more important than saving people's lives and making people's lives better. Isn't that what the gospel is about? Making people's lives better? Isn't it the good news? And this is a huge reason why, even though I am still a Christian, I can no longer consider myself evangelical. On the heels of Dr. Blasey Ford's testimony and feeling a great deal of dismay, disappointment, and sadness, I went to Dayton to hear Reverend Wallace speak. He spoke to the testimony and the feeling of many Americans of being re-traumatized by the events of the day before. He gave his message of compassion and social justice and empathy and the beauty of diversity. I also had a chance to talk with others who were there to listen to Reverend Wallace. Something I struggle with is whether or not young, progressive, socially conscious evangelicals are able to change the American evangelical tradition from the inside. Recently, my answer to that has been no. Because the authoritarianism inherent in evangelicalism, together with the power and money that come from being allied with the GOP and political conservatism, lead to pressure to conform. I'll expound on this more in the next episode. But it was neat to talk with others who are of similar heart and mind, but had more hope for the future. There are still people who are trying, who are doing the heavy lifting, even when the powers that be within the evangelical tradition, might not be on their side. Reverend Wallace also mentioned something that I think is helpful as we're going into the 2018 midterm elections. He said that times of crisis, as we are in this country, as we're clearly dealing with a huge crisis of authority, times of crisis also provide an opportunity to make a difference. I've talked about how the Republicans have placed themselves in a position to where they lack accountability to the American people, yet still get reelected because of how they have tailored the system. But there is an out, if we make a concerted effort to take it. We should still protest. We should still confront current political leaders, regardless of party, if they have attempted to evade accountability and have proven unreachable by traditional methods of communication. Letters, calls, office visits, in person public town halls. But we should also vote. Sometimes people can be so hard hearted that it's not a point in trying to reach them. Which means that if you're still trying to convince your racist uncle or your ignorant buddies that common decency and truth matter, you may want to reevaluate that approach. In the New Testament, When the disciples went to towns and the gospel was not accepted by the townspeople, they were advised to shake the dust from their feet. In other words, you've done what you could, and at that point, cutting your losses is the wisest choice. 
But here's what may prove more fruitful than trying to convince Republicans or Trump supporters to vote Democrat. Reaching non-voters. A few months ago, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was able to defeat her primary opponent in large part because she courted non-voters. So, if done effectively, convincing non-voters to vote may prove more fruitful than trying to convince people who already made up their minds to switch sides. Remember that only 40% of eligible voters vote in the midterms, even fewer for off-year elections. That is 60% of eligible voters who are untapped and not represented. Even if you get a small percentage of those people to come out to vote, that is a factor that cannot be captured by polls, but when it's showtime, it can sway a number of congressional, state, and local races. And winning those races is how we can work to restore true representative democracy in the United States. This is bigger than one election. This is bigger than 2018 or 2020. Guys, this is not instant gratification. Fixing our country is like playing chess. What you do today affects what happens later, next week, next month, next year, next decade. Which is why even though our country may not change immediately, voting today will make a great difference tomorrow, even if tomorrow is in 10 or 20 years. The truth matters. The erosion of democracy and freedom matters. The suffering people are experiencing under Trump's regime matters. And we need to treat it like it matters. Register. Encourage your non-voting family, friends, and neighbors to register. And vote like your life depends on it. Because it does. This episode of Potster Podcast was about taking action and not being paralyzed by the overwhelming stench of our dying democracy. But you can also find yourself being paralyzed when you wake up from sleep. Nick and John talk about sleep paralysis in the latest episode of Stranger Still. Sleep paralysis is something I can resonate with as someone who has had this happen multiple times. It sucks. But this episode definitely doesn't suck. Listen to their newest episode and find out what sleep paralysis is, what can cause it, and some fascinating stories from people who have experienced it. Stranger Still is one of the awesome podcasts on the Flying Machine Network. Listen and subscribe to them on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and most other podcatchers, or go to their website, strangerstillshow.com. And for all Flying Machine Network shows, go to flyingmachine.network slash shows. Thank you so much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on Android. Go to potstirerpodcast.com slash download, and links are right there. If you subscribe, you can get new episodes once they come out, so there's no delay. If you enjoy the podcast, please give us five stars and leave a review. And soon, I'll be creating a new Facebook group for the show to give you guys more of an opportunity to interact with me and each other and discuss issues and share links to related stories with the Potstirer Podcast listening community. So keep an eye out for that. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. I give you the incredible flying machine.